Welcome to the first main episode of Transit 101. In today's episode, we'll learn about the three main building blocks of transit, frequency, span, and coverage. Each of these blocks helps to build the foundation of effective transit systems, and every transit line and network is impacted by all three of these factors, frequency, span, and coverage. Frequency, span, and coverage are the three most important elements of transit and the three main things that service planners can change when they want to modify a transit network. They're the main drivers of cost, but also of quality in your transit network and each can help make your trip faster and more convenient. Let's start with frequency. Frequency is basically just how often your transit service runs. If you have a bus route with a bus that comes every 30 minutes, your frequency is every 30 minutes. Higher frequency is actually a lower number, so 15 minutes is a higher frequency than 30 minutes. You'd have four buses coming per hour compared to two. It's a simple concept to understand, but one that gets overlooked a lot. Frequency gives transit riders more flexibility and choices in how and when they travel, and this convenience is always good for transit riders. This convenience also helps to attract new transit riders as well as improving the transit riding experience for existing riders. Frequency is important for many aspects of a transit trip. The first is travel time. When you decide to leave your house and go on a transit trip, you have several aspects of that trip to consider. The first is your walk to and from the transit stop or station. The second is your waiting time and your third is the actual travel time on the vehicle. Frequency impacts that wait time and reducing wait time reduces your overall trip time as a result. For example, let's say you want to head downtown on the train. You leave your house without looking at the transit schedule. You spend five minutes walking to the train, but the train only runs every 30 minutes, and because you didn't look at the schedule, your average wait time is going to be 15 minutes. The ride itself is 20 minutes downtown once you actually get on a train, so in total, you're looking at a 40 minute trip time between the walk, the wait, and the ride itself. Now let's say this train was way more frequent, running every 10 minutes. You'd still have that five minute walk and the 20 minute ride, but you'd only have a five minute wait time if you had left your house without looking at the schedule. This gives you a 30 minute travel time compared to 40 minutes, saving you 10 minutes of travel time just because of the frequency of a service. The travel time benefit from frequency is easy to overlook because there is no comparable factor for driving a car. When you drive, you can leave whenever you want, and there are no set departure times. This means that people who drive cars are more likely to overlook frequency when planning transit as it's not something they have to think about in their daily lives. Another major benefit to frequency is reliability. Let's say you have a bus with a 30 minute frequency, but the bus you are waiting for breaks down and is cancelled you now have to wait 30 more minutes for the next trip. However, if that route had been running every 10 minutes, you'd only have to wait 10 minutes for the next trip. The same goes for delays. If your bus runs every 30 minutes and is delayed 15 minutes, you're waiting that extra 15 minutes. However, if your bus runs every 10 minutes and is delayed 15 minutes, you might be able to get on the next bus if it's running on time, or on the previous bus if it's also late. The final benefit to frequency is capacity. More frequent service means that you have more vehicles on the road. Each vehicle has a certain number of seats, so adding more vehicles to a route means you're adding more seats to it. Running higher frequency service means you're making room for more riders. So, how does frequency look in the real world? Many transit agencies set standards for what they consider to be high frequency service and create networks of these buses and train lines. These frequent routes are usually centered around places with high travel demand, such as high-density housing, large employment centers, leisure destinations, and universities. Riders living near these frequent networks then have access to a variety of important destinations without a long wait. The standard for high-frequency service varies by city. In San Francisco and Chicago, it's 10 minutes, while it's 15 minutes in Vancouver and Portland. Transit agencies in these cities and regions publish maps of their frequent service networks, letting riders know where they can go quickly and conveniently. There is another step we can take on top of high-frequency service known as rapid service. 
While real-life rapid service varies wildly and can run as infrequently as every 30 minutes, many places set a standard for rapid service of every 10 minutes or better. This applies regardless of the mode of transportation you pick. A service can become rapid whether it's rail or bus once it runs every 10 minutes or better for most of the day and week. This is the threshold where most riders won't look at a schedule and will simply head out to wait for the next departure. Rapid services also tend to have fewer stops, making them faster than local services. We'll talk about them more in another episode. Frequency can also vary based on demand. Many transit agencies run more frequent service during peak weekday commute hours. This allows for greater capacity when more people are trying to move around, and also gives more convenience to riders at a time when driving would be a difficult alternative anyway. The reverse is also true. Many transit agencies reduce frequency in the early morning and late evening, when demand is usually lower. While this is a more efficient use of resources, it can also make it difficult for many to choose transit as it becomes a much less convenient option if you need to travel during these times. The second transit building block is called span. Span is defined by how many hours of the day your transit service runs. Span is essential to transit because it tells people when and where they can travel. The more hours of a day and days of a week that a transit service runs, the more people will have access to it to meet their specific travel needs. And longer span services in this sense encourage more freedom for transit riders. For example, the span of MTS Route 204 in San Diego is from 5.58 a.m. to 10.01 p.m. on weekdays, or a total of just over 16 hours a day. This also applies to the days your service runs. The 204 doesn't run at all on weekends, so it has no span at all on those days. There are several types of trips that benefit from a longer span of service. First is commuting. While the 9 to 5 office worker doesn't need a ton of service span, they might want to go to the gym or the grocery store on their way home, or go out for dinner or drinks with colleagues. These all require a longer span of service beyond typical commuting hours. Many people also have jobs that don't fit the 9 to 5 schedule, or have long commutes meaning that they need services that run earlier and later to make it to their jobs on time. Besides work, however, there are many other uses of span. People need to buy groceries, visit friends and family, and take time to relax at parks and recreation areas. Even in the middle of the night, people need to get around. Having overnight transit accommodates people who work in bars and convenience stores, while allowing their customers to get home safely without driving under the influence. People relying on buses like the MTS Route 204 can't do a lot of things because of the service's limited span. They can't be out after 10 p.m. on weekdays, and can't go out at all on weekends unless they have another transit line nearby. Having a long span of service can also be helpful to potential riders simply for peace of mind. Whether or not you'd use service that runs late into the evening, sometimes it's helpful to know that you can get home at midnight if you need to. When I lived in Seattle's U District, I was very fortunate to have a few overnight bus lines, which saved me a few times when I needed to get home late at night. While I only took advantage of these services a handful of times, they were instrumental in giving me the peace of mind to know I could go out at night and still make it home without having to get an expensive Uber, no matter how long I wanted to stay out at IHOP. The final, and arguably most important, building block of a transit system is coverage. Coverage is simply where your transit system serves. More coverage is usually better, since it means you're serving more places and therefore more people. If someone doesn't have a bus route nearby them, they're probably not going to take the bus, so ensuring everyone has good access to transit is the main goal of having good coverage. Generally, it's important to try and cover as much of your city and region as possible with transit service. Having service within walking distance of as many people as possible is essential to building a comprehensive network. If you only have coverage to certain areas, even people who may have coverage to where they live may not be able to use transit if their destinations, like their jobs, aren't served. Good coverage can also speed up your overall trip by reducing how far you have to walk, roll, bike, or drive to access transit. From this, we can also see how coverage and span are so closely linked. If your transit agency doesn't run certain routes on weekends, the coverage of the system as a whole is then reduced for the days that those routes don't run. 
Going back to the MTS 204, that route doesn't run on weekends, reducing the transit coverage in the areas the route serves on Saturdays and Sundays. People living in areas with poor transit coverage are less likely to take transit because they have to walk, bike, or drive longer distances to reach it. This is especially bad for people who are less likely to be able to drive, such as lower income residents, residents with disabilities, as well as youth, seniors, and other groups. Poor transit coverage limits their mobility and requires them to get rides from friends, spend too much of their money on ride sharing services, or simply not take trips they would if they could otherwise have a convenient choice. Coverage can also be taken too far with unnecessary deviations slowing down bus routes, but we'll talk more about that in a later video. So, how do these three building blocks fit together and what are the trade-offs? The main thing tying them together is that they all cost money. Doubling the frequency of a bus route, such as from every 30 to every 15 minutes, also doubles the cost of that bus route, as you have to have twice as many buses and drivers out on the road at one time. Increased span and coverage also have proportional increases in cost. Transit agencies run on a fixed budget, so an increase in one area usually leads to a decrease in at least one of the other two. Let's look at an example and make up a transit system for a made-up small city. Currently, we're running service every 30 minutes on six routes, which cover our city fairly well. These routes each run from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. However, our transit agency decides they want to focus frequency on the two busiest routes. They then increase these routes from 30 to 15 minute frequency. This is great for riders on those routes, but it comes at a cost. Each of our routes currently uses two buses at a time to run every 30 minutes. So these two routes now use four buses each at a time. This is a total increase of four buses system-wide. However, because of our fixed budget, our transit agency has to decrease service in other areas to make up for this increase on these busy routes. As a result, they cut their least busy route entirely, saving two buses and reduce two more to a frequency of once an hour. This means that people being served by our two now frequent routes have major benefits from the service, but nearly everyone else in the city sees a decrease in transit service, with some losing access to transit entirely. Geographically, about one-third of the city benefits from this change, while half sees a decrease and one-sixth no longer has transit service at all. Transit planning is a world of difficult trade-offs. Planners have to decide what their priorities are and make decisions accordingly. Without an increase in budget, which we'll go more into in later videos, transit agencies can't really make your service better without making it worse for someone else. Everyone has their own philosophy on this, and you have to decide what's most important to you. Coverage, frequency, or span. In some countries and cities, transit gets enough funding that you can have a good amount of all three. But in most of the US and Canada, there are tough trade-offs to be made. Personally, I'm in favor of coverage. I think that letting people access transit is the most important factor, and allows people to travel to all kinds of jobs and other destinations. I think that SPAN then goes hand in hand with coverage for the same reasons, providing basic access to transit when people need it. And finally, while I do love frequent transit, I think that it's a little bit less important than ensuring people can get onto transit in the first place, and sacrificing frequency for coverage and SPAN is necessary in some cases. Coverage also gives an area a sense of permanence. While a bus route is definitely far from a permanent thing and can be cut, people don't like having things being taken away from them, including their bus routes. So once we have coverage, it's easier to convince people that they want to pay more taxes to get better service and more frequency from the bus routes that they already have. So, now that you know the building blocks of transit, here's your Transit 101 homework. Get curious about your local transit system. If you live near a bus, rail, or ferry line, find a schedule for it and find out some more information. How frequent is the service? How long is the span of service? Where does it go? What is the coverage? Your transit agency probably has a system map that shows all of the routes together. What is the coverage of the system as a whole? Are some routes more frequent than others? What are the frequent routes? Are there coverage gaps where people don't have access to transit? Does this all make sense? 
Has your agency prioritized providing service in a way that you think works? If you write it, how do these service decisions impact your daily life? If you don't, what can your transit agency do to improve service and get you on board? Whether or not you ride transit regularly, go for a bus ride. You can't do high quality transit planning if you don't know what it's like to take transit. You need to live the experience of a transit rider and understand their needs and wants. Things that look good on paper may not look so good in person, and vice versa. Ask yourself questions about the service as you ride and see how things feel for you in real life. Take some time to answer these questions on your own. Feel free to share with others in the comment section, and I'll see you next time on Transit 101. Thank you.